Back key. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. And um, it's such a great joy to be with you all. I hope you're happy and healthy and enjoying uh, 2023 so far. Today's webinar is one of my personal favorite topics. That's birding and birdsong identification. And I have the great pleasure of introducing our panelists today. I'm also really lucky that I get to work with this individual every single day. So uh, my pleasure to introduce Brian Popolier. Brian is our talented land stewardship coordinator where he utilizes his experience to perform ecological inventories on over 18,000 acres of BTC managed lands and prepare management plans for BTC properties as well as supporting clubs in stewardship, encroachment and ecological issues. Brian holds a Bachelor's of Science in Environmental Science and Biology from Trent University, as well as certificates in Ecological Land Classification, Bird and Plant Identification, Butternut Assessments, Ontario Pesticide and Forestry License, and is an Ontario Wetland Evaluation. Um, Brian can often be found in the forests and watersheds of Ontario, hiking, fishing, taking pictures, camping, or enjoying nature's beauty, but also, of course, he's always out there birding. So, Brian, uh, our great pleasure to have you. Welcome, and we're excited for today. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. It was a wonderful introduction, and it's always appreciated. Um, so, yeah, welcome, everyone, to our introduction of birds along the Bruce Trail and the Niagara Escarpment. So, the Bruce Trail and the Niagara Escarpment, it's basically, in my mind, it's a birding paradise. So all the way from Niagara to Tobermory, the escarpment provides many different habitats for hundreds of bird species. So anything from forests to wetlands to meadows, um, you know, swamp thickets, all that type of habitat is just a fantastic place for birds to, to thrive. So the escarpment itself, where you know you see the soaring cliffs, that's a huge benefit for raptors as they um, as they migrate and then just go about their daily routine. So as the wind hits the cliff, what happens is it creates an updraft and the wind goes up into the atmosphere. So as raptors, as if you know or you don't know, they, you know, they spread their wings and kind of soar on the on the, the wind current. So the escarpment and the updrafts that it creates is a kind of like a huge aid in flight for the, that type of, of bird. So there's there has been over 300 species recorded along the entire length. Um, of the escarpment, so that's from like Niagara to Tobermory. So this number is kind of, you know, it's kind of estimated from, you know, bird counts that other organizations do. Um, myself and the other ecologists with the uh, Bruce Trail Conservancy, we do breeding bird surveys. So that number is kind of calculated from, from those types of surveys and observations. So speaking of the BTC ecologists, so we have personally observed um, 188 species on BTC owned or managed lands. So that's a, you know, it's a fairly it's a high number. Um, and it just shows a diversity of birds that our properties, you know, are helping to protect and, and provide habitat for, um, you know, breeding and overwintering and, and whatnot. So today we're gonna to focus on some more common species likely to be seen as you hike the trail. Um, like I said, there, there's over 300 species of birds, and there's no way that we're going to fit that many birds into, you know, 40, 50 minutes of a, of a presentation. So, you know, I've kind of tried to pick and choose some of the more common ones that you're probably going to see when you go out for a hike. So, it's also like many species also have more than one song or call. So, I'm going to try to focus on the most common sounds that you would likely hear when you're, you know, walking or hiking the trail. You know, some, some species, for instance, have, you know, 10, 15 different, different songs or, or sounds that they can make. So, um, so it is <laughs> when you're birding, um, it's all about getting out there, um, you know, bringing your, your, your binoculars and, and your field guides and stuff to, to, to really kind of encompass yourself into the natural environment so you can kind of hear the different bird, bird songs. Um, to really kind of get a handle on what you're seeing and, and how to identify it. So many birds have both songs and calls. So the songs is their primary song that they use, generally the males use to attract the females. Calls are much harder because they're not, a lot of times it's just a simple short sound, like a chip, like chip, chip, 
So you'll, you'll be hiking the trail and you'll, you'll hear this beside you, this little chip, chip, chip. So there could be five different birds that have that sound similar with that little chip call. So a lot of times calls are much harder to identify. So I've only tried to include calls um, if they are kind of easily identifiable. So mostly it's only the male birds who sing and you know they use their songs to attract the females. However, some species such as cardinals, um, both sexes are actually found to, to sing the song. So the general rule is that birds sing more in the spring and summer during the breeding season, but they do also sing in the fall and winter months as well, but not as frequent. So if you go for a hike today, for instance, you know, you might hear a cardinal sing, but you know, it'll sing once or twice and that's it. And then it'll be silent. Whereas in the spring and summer, you'll hear a cardinal just sing, you know, 40 times in, in 10 minutes. So field equipment. So this is, you know, if you, if you want to go out and identify birds, this is some important stuff to have. So I would say binoculars is the, is the number one thing. Because you really want to be able to, if you see a bird, you really want to be able to kind of zoom in on it. And that way you can see the different colors, the, the shape of the bird. So binoculars are a huge help. A good field guide is another essential in my mind. Um, I just put a picture up of this. this is, it's specifically about warblers, and it's by Chris Early from the University of Guelph. Um, there's many field guides out there. Um, these this specific series of field guides, you know, there's one on warblers, there's one on raptors and owls, there's one on sparrows, um, there's one on waterfowl. So they're very, very specific to the group of, of bird that you're looking for. Some of the more general field guides are, um, you got the Audubon Society, they have a great field guide. The Peterson Field Guides, they're also very, very good field guides for, uh, for beginners or advanced. <clears throat> and then we have a camera. So once again, you know, when you're out in the field, Sometimes it's great to have that camera to, you know, kind of capture the bird and then you can bring that picture back and have a look at it more closely just to see, you know, it's more easy to identify a bird when you have a static shot rather than when it's flitting around the trees. It's very hard to see sometimes. And then of course, a pad and paper, you always wanna, you know, if you're trying to identify birds, it's important to write down what you see, kind of what you hear, the habitat they're in, and, and that type of stuff. So there's five keys to bird identification. <clears throat> First thing is the uh, size and shape. You know, not all birds are the same. Um, you know, some are smaller, some are larger, some have bigger, bigger wingspan. Um, just that's the, probably the first thing you want to you want to note is the size and the shape. And then color and the pattern of the bird obviously is very important. Different birds have different colors, different patterns, etc. So the behavior and the flight pattern. So many birds have different flight patterns. So when they're flying in the sky, some have a soaring flight pattern. Some have more of a, they, they flap and then they glide. They flap and then they glide. So that's an important thing to kind of, kind of learn as you're going along. Habitat and distribution, so like where a bird is. For instance, an eastern wood peewee is a forest bird. So you're really not going to see an eastern wood peewee in a swamp, in a, like a wetland habitat. So you're not going to see it in a marsh. So it's important, you know, certain birds are considered wetland birds, certain birds are considered forest birds. And uh, so yeah, it's important to kind of note where, where you see the bird. And then last is the sound. A lot, a lot of times you're not gonna see the bird, but you're gonna hear it. So it's very, very important that you kind of learn your bird songs. So once again, you're not gonna go out in, in a week and you're gonna learn all the birds. I mean, there's so many birds, there's so many different species, different sounds, I mean, I've known people who've been uh, birding for 25 years and sometimes they still are like, what, what's that sound? What's making that sound? So it's not, uh, it's not a one day learning track that you're gonna be doing. So I also included a little picture here. So it's 
you know, it's important to kind of know kind of like the terminology of what you're looking at when you're um, trying to identify birds. So not everyone uses these exact terms. And these pictures are all over the internet. You just search, you know, a bird identification picture and you'll, you'll find these pictures. So we're going to start with our winter visitors and birds that stick around all year long. <clears throat> so not all birds migrate. So some live here all year round. So these tend to be some of the more common and easily identifiable species, such as Mr. Blue Jay there squawking away. Um, cardinals, you know, chickadees, those types of birds, they stick around all year long. So they're, um, these, right now, this is when you wanna go out and try to find these species. And then some other species just visit Southern Ontario just in the winter months. So those would include like snow buntings, horned larks, uh, tree sparrows, dark-eyed juncos, and snowy owls. So those are examples of kind of what I call the winter visitors. All right, so let's get into it. So our first bird is the black-capped chickadee. So I'm assuming a lot of people are familiar with this bird. It's a small little fella. Um, it has a black cap and has a throat, black cap and throat, and then has white cheeks has gray on the back and the wings, and then has a whitish underbelly. So it has a simple kind of two or three note whistle. And to me, it sounds like saying cheeseburger. And uh, so that's why I also call it when I'm doing hikes, um, interpretive hikes, I call it the cheeseburger bird, just because I think it's very fitting. Um, and then it has a call that is simply their name. So it's chickadee dee dee dee. So when you hear that, you kind of, you know, it's a chickadee. I mean, it's, it's basically telling you what its name is. So I do have sounds embedded in this. So we're going to play one right here. Oh. So yeah, so that was the, the cheeseburger song. Cheeseburger. <laughs> So the habitat, so these little birds are found in deciduous and mixed forests, open woods, parks, willow thickets, forested edges, your backyard. Um, you know, you'll see these birds pretty much everywhere. They are one of the most common birds that you're, you're going to encounter along the trail. And they are cavity nesters. So that means they nest in the holes and trees created by other species. <coughs> So what happens is a, a woodpecker, for instance, they're a type of bird that'll go to a dead tree and they'll peck at it and they'll open up a, like a little cavity and they'll nest in it. The next year they might abandon that nest. So guess who's gonna come and take advantage of that hole that's already been dug out and excavated is a, a little chickadee is gonna fly in there and they'll produce, a, produce their nest. So another common bird, which once again, I'm sure everyone uh, is familiar with. So this is the Northern Cardinal. So it's a larger bird. It has a longer tail and a really thick bill on it. And they're known to have that, that you know, that crest of feathers on their head, whereas you can see in the, the picture, there's that nice little crest on there. So the males are red and uh, they have a black mask in the throat. Females are a lot paler. They're, they're, they're more like a pale brown. And they do have reddish tinges in the feathers and that thick beak that really, really stands out. So their song is a long string of two parted whistles. <clears throat> so when you see the, the words in quotations, that's kind of my interpretation of what the birds sound like. You know, a lot of, a lot of other bird, birders will, may, might have a different sound that it sounds like. So what we do is we take kind of like English phrases to put together to the song so it's easier to remember. So the cheeseburger in the previous um, slide, to me that's just, that bird sounds like it's saying cheeseburger. So whenever I hear that, I, I immediately go to black cat chickadee. So the cardinal, to me it sounds like it's saying, you know, purdy, 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 purdy. So the song, sometimes it often speeds up at the end. So let's have a listen to this one.
<laughs> so did you hear pretty 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 you might not have but uh, you might have heard something else some people say it sounds like it's saying pretty so pretty 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 so these these birds so they, they love forest edges overgrown fields hedgerows backyards you know regenerating forests once again, it's a very common bird that you put out a bird feeder in the winter, you'll likely have the chickadees and the cardinals. So um, you'll be able to get a really good close up of these birds if you have your bird feeder placed, you know, in the right spot where you can have a good look at it. <clears throat> so these are one of the few species that's range has actually expanded with human development. So it just cardinals just tend to like, you know, kind of, broken up thickets and, and 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 hedgerows so you know that type of habitat has increased um with human development so you know they said where, wherever there's kind of human development they've actually moved north from the south as uh you know land gets developed so next we have a blue jay if you notice i'm not going too far off the <laughs> the common spectrum here for now um so yeah, once again a very easy bird to identify uh, the males and females are similar it's uh, hard to tell them apart so they have a long tail and once again you know we have that crested head head feathers so blue on top blue on top and white on the bottom with uh they have a black necklace and black barring on the wings and tail as well as a white wing bar so if you notice in the picture you can see the wings are folded, but you can see that kind of white wing bar that slides across the, the wing. So blue jays is really difficult to say there's any specific vocalization that is kind of more common. This is, this is one of the birds that has a, a variety of sounds and calls, but the most common, I think, um, it's just a really loud um, jeer or jay. So, you know, jay, that's appropriate, the blue jay. So let's see if we can hear this one. So yeah, very very common sound in the in the forest, um, in your backyard, <clears throat> forest edges, um, any urban and residential areas. Uh, once again, blue jays, uh, they have very little fear of, of humans. Um, I've seen them pretty much everywhere. A common bird, once again, you put out a bird feeder if you're close to a forest edge and you'll have blue jays. And they'll be, um, they'll be jaying at you like that. They, they love, to, love to make a lot, of, a lot of noise, these birds. They're very loud. And they also have a call that's almost identical to a broad-winged hawk or a red-shouldered hawk. So it's... Once again, I have been walking, walking through the, the forest doing field work and I get all excited because, you know, broad winged hawks or red shouldered hawks, they're not, not real common. You don't see them very much. So, you know, I'll be walking through the forest doing field work and then I'll hear that broad winged hawk call and I'll be all excited. So I'll have the camera up getting ready and well, lo and behold, there's a nice blue jay lands right in front of you and just kind of looks at you like, ha ha, I got you. Um, so yeah, but they, they, they do that more as, as an alarm call as well, because when they do that song, all the other birds come to attention because they think there's a broad-winged hawk in the area. So it's a, you know, really kind of cool, the vocalization styles of blue jays. So snow bunting. So these are, these are smaller birds and almost always seen on the ground or the odd time you'll see them on again the picture on, on a fence post <clears throat> once again male and females are very similar during the fall and winter which we're going to see them now um, so they have gray and brown streaked backs and a white underbelly during breeding season um, the males backs they do turn more of a, a striking dark black so their song is a musical low warble so I didn't put a song in here with the snow buntings because right now you won't really won't hear them sing because this is not their um, their area where they breed. Um, but they do 
they do migrate down here from the tundra actually. So they spend their winter in open fields and agricultural fields, shorelines and roadsides. So like I said, these birds, they breed in the open rocky areas in the tundra. Um, but when they come down to Southern Ontario, I find the best place to find them is you just drive down some not busy side roads and just have a look. A lot of times they'll actually be on the road because what they're doing is they're, they're kind of, the road is where there's, there's not a lot of snow. So they'll be on the sides of the road trying to find any, any kind of seeds or, or spilt grain from say agricultural practices and um, maybe even the road, the road salt. So if you, you know you drive slowly down a side road, you'll see like sometimes you'll see huge flocks of these, like hundreds of snow buntings um, will lift off. And the sight of a flock of snow buntings is amazing because once again they're they're like a striking white. So when you see hundreds of birds flying in formation, um, it's just a spectacular sight to see. One place where you will see them as you're hiking the trail is if you come across a really big open field, a lot of times you'll see these little birds, um, especially in an old agricultural field, because they're what they're doing is they're going after the, the grain. So that's where you'll see them. The most recent area where I've seen a, a huge flock of these is on our new uh, um, Maple Cross Nature Reserve at Cape Chin up on the peninsula. So now we're going to look at a couple woodpeckers. So this is the downy and the hairy woodpeckers. <clears throat> so the reason I put these two in the same slide is because they're almost identical. Um, you can see in the picture, you got the downy up top and then you got the hairy. So these are, they're white underneath with black and white upper parts. And then they both have a red patch at the back of the head. So how do you tell them apart? Well, hairy woodpeckers, tend to be larger than the downies. So downies are a smaller sized bird. And then the hairy woodpeckers, they also have a longer beak. But, you know, when you're in the, in the forest, it's really hard to judge the size, how long the beak is on, on sometimes on these, on these birds. So the hairy woodpeckers outer tail feathers are generally completely white, while the downy woodpecker has black spots on its tail feathers. And then also that red patch in the back of the head, the downy woodpecker, sometimes it's it's not, it's split into two little patches, whereas the hairy will always be just a solid red patch on the back of the head. So they don't really have songs, but they have calls. So the downy, to me, this is the easiest way to, uh, to um, separate the two. So the downy woodpecker is a string of hoarse, high-pitched notes that descend in pitch toward the end. So the hairy sounds similar to the downy, but it does not have that descending pitch at the end. So let's, uh, let's listen. So yeah, did you hear that? So that, and then it goes down. Whereas the hairy, Yeah. So it just it keeps the same string of notes. There's there's no downward um, um, descending in pitch at the end. So once again, to me, that's the easiest way to tell the two apart. So these are they're in all forest types. They love uh, you know deciduous, coniferous, mixed forests, um, woodlands, which is a it's it's a, a treed area, but it's not as thick as a forest. <clears throat> very common in parks, um, swamps, forest edges. So uh, once again, these two, two birds are very common in Ontario. So like most woodpeckers, uh, more than 75% of their diet is insects. So they especially love the larva of wood borer insects. So this is a, has been of interest to um, scientists with regards to the emerald ash borer. So what studies have shown is that although it's, woodpeckers are not going to wipe out the emerald ash borer, what they have shown to do is that they actually slow the spread. So in, in one area where there's a lot of woodpeckers um, in a central area, they're eating a lot of the ash borer larva, 
and that has kind of slowed the, the speed of the spread of, of, of the borer. Whereas you, if you don't have any woodpeckers in an area, the borer just spreads like crazy. So like I said, it's not a solution, but it, it's, you know, at least it's a little bit of a tool in, in the fight against the emerald ash borer. So another winter visitor. So this is the dark eyed junco. So you won't see these in the spring and summer. Late fall, you'll start to see juncos, especially if you have a, a bird feeder, you'll see the, the junco start to show up. <clears throat> so once again, very easy to identify. You're looking for the medium sized bird with that gray up top and then the white underneath. <clears throat> so males and females are similar in color. They have an even musical trail of seven to 23 notes. Once again, I didn't include the song um, just because you're, you're very rarely hear these ones sing because um, they don't breed here. They breed up in the boreal forest. So you'll find these little birds in open woodlands and fields, roadsides, parks, and, and backyards. So once again, a very, very, very common bird. So when you do see these birds, so during the winter months down here, they often form lar large flocks and they often join other species such as sparrows. So what you'll do is you'll, you'll see like a multi-species flock of birds. And so much like sparrows, juncos love to be on the ground in low shrubs, low thickets. <clears throat> so you'll see maybe 50, 50 birds flitting about in the thicket. And you might have 20 juncos, you'll have like, um, 10 chickadees, you'll have 10 um, tree sparrows, for instance, and they'll all be together because when you think of small little birds, um, it's all about protection, right, from predators. It's a lot harder to get picked off by, say, a, a Cooper's hawk when there's 50 of you when there's, when there's, than when there's just two of you. So, um, you know, safety in numbers, as they say. So another woodpecker, this is the red-bellied woodpecker. So they are a medium-sized bird with a red cap and uh, the back of the neck. So you can see that right there in the picture. So they have a pale belly and a black and white barring on the upper parts. So once again, once you see this bird and you get to know it, it's very easy to identify. So the females are similar, but they don't have the, the red cap that goes all the way across the head. So in the picture, that's actually a female. Um, the male would have that red that would go right over basically to the beak. So these have a loud, like, kind of like a queer or cheer. So other common call is, uh, it, you'll hear like a chuck, 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 chuck. So it's, it descends in pitch. Very similar to the pileated woodpecker. So their call is very similar, similar to the pileated woodpecker. So sometimes it's hard to tell the two apart just by voice alone. And then funny enough, their loud, the, the cheer is very similar to the red headed woodpecker. <laughs> so once again, there's very subtle differences that with experience, your, your ear will pick up. But when you're first beginning and you, you hear either one of those, um, those calls, it's very easy to you know, mix them up with either the redheaded or the, uh, the pileated. So let's have a listen here. Here, we'll do that again, that was quick. So that's their, you know, kind of like their queer or their cheer um, call. So they, they love to hang out in deciduous and mixed forests, uh, swamps, um, along rivers. You'll find also find these in urban areas where there's large trees or, or like a park where there's um even though there's open areas, there's some 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 trees or woodland. <clears throat> and they also love forest edges. So the interesting thing about these birds, they can stick out their tongue almost five centimeters, so past their beak. So that's you know, that's a good good distance and it's actually barbed and it's uh, they have a sticky spit so all this aids in grabbing their prey which once again is insects or insect larvae 
so deep within tree openings. So they can, what they do is they peck their hole. They'll actually listen to the tree that they're standing on. And they'll hear the insect in the bark or, or under the bark or in the tree. And that's when they'll peck. And then they'll stick that barbed tongue into that opening, of, almost like an anteater to grab, you know, grab the, the food stores. So the red-bellied woodpecker. So people are like, a lot of people say, why is it called the red belly? It doesn't really have a red belly. Well, it actually does, but it's a very, very light tinge on its belly. And a lot of times we can't really see that because as you see in the picture, whenever you see one of these birds, that's how you're gonna see it. So it always has its belly pressed up against the tree bark. <laughs> so very rarely do you actually see the belly of a red-bellied woodpecker. But once again, it's not like it's a bright red. It's a very, very slight tinge of red. All right, so now we're going to jump into migratory birds. <clears throat> so all those birds we just looked at, those are ones, year-round residents are ones that kind of come um, only here for the winter. So the woodpeckers are here year-round. So most birds in Ontario actually migrate south for the winter. So they usually start to arrive in late April and then stay to breed. They raise their young and then they, once they're young and fledged, then they fly back south and basically in late August, September, sometimes staying around to October. So a lot of these birds portray a much brighter color for breeding plumage during the breeding season before they molt to a much duller plumage for migration. So just in the picture here, this is a Palm, yellow palm warbler. So the bottom picture is their breeding plumage. And then the top picture is their fall plumage. So you, you can just see kind of like the yellows around the eye is a little bit brighter. And then that little kind of red cap is, is a lot brighter. And the picture on the top, it just like the, the colors are duller in general. Um, a lot of birds are, are even more brightly colored than, than this bird. So here we got a, the black and white warbler. So personally, these are one of my, this is one of my favorite groups. Warblers are just gorgeous birds. They're small, small little birds, very active, but they're very colorful. And uh, it's really awesome to try to identify warblers. <clears throat> this one is a pretty easy warbler, black and white, small bird. And yeah, it just has the black and white stripes all over. Um, you know, really thin bill. Um, the males have the, have a black ear patch while the females have a whiter throat and they're a little bit duller in color. So their song is a soft quiet. So it's kind of like a we see, we see, we see, we see, we see. So it's, a lot of people say it's similar to a squeaky wheel. So let's see if we can hear that squeaky wheel. So right there. That is a, a warbler. <laughs> so it's basically that squeak at the beginning. That right there. So it's a very, very faint. This is a very, very faint. It's like squeak, 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 squeak. So it's sometimes like, like I'm going to. People like myself, you know, I'm, I'm getting older in my age. So your hearing starts to go. So at some point, sometimes a black and white warbler is one of the first warblers that you, all of a sudden you won't be able to hear because it's in that pitch, that very high pitch that um, if you have any, any issues with your hearing that you won't actually be able to, to hear that bird. I'm not quite there yet. I can still hear the, the black and white warbler. So these, uh, these birds are like very large continuous stands of mature or uh, you know deciduous mixed forest, cedar swamps or bogs and, or riparian habitat. So that's habitat along a water course or a river. <clears throat> so they are area sensitive um, and they're, they are interior forest species, which mean that they require large tracts of uninterrupted habitat, specifically forested land for this species. So they're not going to breed in a little, 
one acre patch or one hectare patch of, of forest. They need like 50 big large tracts, like 50 hectares, 100 hectares. That's why huge spans of forest that are continuous, which means there's no roads going through it, there's no edge. They really, they really need that type of habitat to to survive. Um, so um, a lot of the work that the, the Bruce Trail does, you know, acquiring these large patches of of uh, parcels of land that are forested, is really, really important for um, you know the survival of, of species like the black and white warbler. So a really interesting fact is that they have a they have a really they have an extra long hind claw and stronger legs than most warblers because a lot of time you see this little fella that's what they do that's how they spend their time that's how they find their food is they walk up and down the the bark of, or the trunks of trees you know looking for the, the insects. So the American robin. Once again, very familiar bird. Um, most people are familiar with this one. <clears throat> so it's medium sized bird, got really familiar orange breast, the dark head, yellow bill and the grayish back. Males and females are very similar. So they have a string of clear whistles and notes. So it kind of sounds like they're saying like, cheerly, cheer up, cheer up, cheerly, cheer up. So I might not do it justice with my, uh, my take on what they sound like, but let's listen to one. So yeah, very, very common, common sound. So these are one of the earliest birds to arrive in spring and that's why people love them because as soon as they see a robin, they're like, oh, spring's coming. That's why because they're so early, they can actually um, have up to three broods of chicks. So as the as climate change is, is happening, sometimes people, you know, it's kind of seen that they're actually starting to stay in Southern Ontario all year round. So, so the yellow warbler. So this is a small sized bird with a you know bright yellow coloring, yellow green back, orange streaks on the on the breast, and that very distinct black eye. So females are duller in color with no streaking on the breast. So they have a very melodic series of whistle notes. So it kind of sounds like they're saying, sweet, 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 I'm so sweet. So that one's kind of kind of missing the sweet, sweet, sweet. But if you if you heard that, it's kind of I, I could hear that. I'm so sweet. I'm so sweet. So these are these are more like wetland birds. They love swamp thickets, uh, marshes, regenerating thickets. Um, a lot of times when you're hiking on the Bruce Trail and you walk by a, a thicket of um, like willows, you'll see these little yellow warblers, and they're hard to miss because um, of their bright color and that that uh, lovely song. Song sparrow. So now we're into the sparrows, a very difficult group of birds to identify because the sparrows, they're these little brown birds, are, they all look the same. But to me, the song sparrow is one of the easiest ones. So a uh, medium sized bird and a pretty thick beak. It's the brown stripes on the body and it's that dark spot on their chest that uh, to me really yells out that it's a song sparrow. Um, males and females are very similar. So they have a loud string of notes that end with a buzz or a trill. So it kind of sounds like they're saying, maids, 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 put on the tea, kettle, 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 kettle. <laughs> Let's see if I, if I hit that right. Yeah, I think I did pretty good. So sparrows tend to be, they love open habitats such as meadows and old fields, agricultural fields and parks. So these are the birds that you'll see kind of flitting on the ground. Um, jumping up into a little shrub and then back on the ground. They will fly up to a perch and that's when they'll just belt out their song. Um, but generally these are like ground loving birds, kind of low cover, 
Um, very rarely will you see them very high up in a tree. Um, so like I said, they're very hard to identify, but they are one of the first sparrows to arrive back in the spring. So if you see a little brown streak bird flitting around low to the ground and then letting out that loud, loud song, um, generally it's gonna be a song sparrow. So the black-throated green warbler. So it's a small bird with black throat, yellow cheeks and white wing bars. Has an olive green back and top of head and has black streaking on the pale underbelly. So the main difference in the females is that they have a white throat. So it has a buzzy series of notes. So it kind of sounds like it's good. It does uh, Z, 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 Z. So to me, it sounds like it's saying trees, 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 murmuring trees. Uh, let's listen to this one. Yep, that's it. So these are once again forest birds. You'll find them in deciduous coniferous and mixed forest. Um, these are also area sensitive and interior forest species. So once again, they need that large patch of uh, of land to um, you know go through all their stages of their life cycle. So like a lot of birds, these birds sing a lot. Um, you'll, you'll hear them like sing a hundred times in, in, in like an hour. They'll just sing, sing continuously and continuously. <clears throat> and like most birds, and especially warblers, it's very hard to track. You'll catch a glimpse of them, catch a glimpse of them, but then sometimes they'll have that, they'll land right in front of you, and that's when you need to, if you have a camera, you need to get that, that shot. So eastern wood peewees. So these are medium-sized flycatchers. So they're in the flycatcher group of birds. They have a pale belly and olive gray back and white wing bars. So the males and females are similar as well. So they have a soft, slightly sad sounding. So it sounds like there's, to me, it sounds like they're saying POE. So this is one of the birds that, whose song sounds like its name. So kind of like the chickadee, right? You have the chickadee basically saying its name. Um, the wood peewee does the same. So there, there you go. So it sounds like he's saying pee wee. <laughs> um, so yeah, when you hear that, very easy to identify. That's the Eastern wood pee. Um, so you're gonna hear that in deciduous and coniferous and mixed forest and forest edges. So this is a forest bird. You won't hear it in a, in a, in a meadow. You won't hear it in a swamp They or a, a marsh. They, they love to be in, in, in forests. So this is one of the birds that is actually, it's a, it's kind of been considered a species at risk. So declines of the species have occurred throughout its range. So this species feeds on insects. So there's a lot of speculation going on that a lot of the, there's a decline in our insect population, which is affecting um, bird insectivores, which the Eastern wood pea is part of that. So habitat loss and cowbird parasitism are also affecting the species. So it was actually designated a special concern in Canada um, and Ontario in November of 2012. This is a very common bird um, along the escarpment. Pretty much every property the BTC owns or manages, if it has a, a forest, I, I've heard Eastern wood peewees in it. So once again, um, you know, our mission is really helping species like, like this bird um, survive and, and hang on. So wood thrush, this is a little bigger uh, sized bird and cinnamon brown coloring on the back and the neck um, and the crown. And then it has a white belly with black spots and a white eye ring. So the American Robin is actually a thrush, um, but then you have the wood thrush, the Swainson's thrush, hermit thrush. These are all kind of difficult. They, once again, they all look the same. So it's hard to, unless you get a good look at it and a good listen to the song, it's, it, it's, uh, it's, it's sometimes hard to identify these birds. <clears throat> so it has a loud flute like kind of like eole and that's uh listen to this one it's a beautiful sound so 
so yeah, when, you, when you're walking through the forest, you hear that sound, sound it's just, uh, for me, it blows you away. So very similar to the Eastern Wood Peewee. So it's designated as threatened in Canada and special concern in Ontario in 2012. <clears throat> and so they like the same kind of forest as the Eastern Wood Peewees. So once again, you know, protecting forest is, is a huge help to the species of bird. So the Scarlet Tanager, very easy bird to identify. It's got that bright red on it or the black wings and very hard to misidentify. The females are actually an olive yellow in color with the darker wings. So this song sounds like it's a series of blurry notes and people say it sounds like a robin with a sore throat, but it does have a very distinctive call and it's called, it's, it's chick burr, chick burr, chick burr. So you'll hear that in the forest, you know, it's a scarlet tanager. So yeah, if you remember the robin, I'm, I'm not sure if you can kind of picture that that sounds like a robin with a sore throat, but uh, that's what the birders say. Once again, it's the area sensitive interior forest species, um, loves large patches of mixed or deciduous forest. So it's a very, very bright bird. And so you, you think, oh, it's very easy to, to identify. The problem is that the thing never leaves the canopy. It's always up in the high canopy. So a lot of times you actually don't see scarlet tanagers, but you'll hear that song. Um, I, I found the best time to see them is really early spring when they're just coming back because they tend to come lower. And that picture I actually, I took was the bird was only like four feet off the ground. So it just kind of stayed there and looked at me. So very easy to get a picture. Rose-breasted grosbeak. I'm starting to speed up here because I, I realize I'm, running out of time, but I hope people don't mind if I go over a little bit, because I, I am very passionate about birds <laughs> and I uh, thought it was important to include all these species. So, so the rose-breasted grosbeak. So it's a medium-sized bird, has a nice thick beak, black head and upper parts, bright red bib and white underparts and wing patches. And as you can see from the lower picture, the females are completely different. So they're like pale brown with um, streaks and a white eyebrow. So here's another bird that people say sounds like a robin, but this one, they say it sounds more melodic than a robin. So it's, this one sounds like a robin who's singing an opera. So we'll see if that's true. So yeah, that's your call and whether you think it sounds like a robin singing an opera. These, these birds also have a distinctive chip. So high up in the canopy, you'll hear, you'll hear this chip, chip, chip. And um, you kind of know it's a rose-breasted grosbeak. Um, once again, it's a forest bird. Um, loves, you know, mixed in deciduous forest, riparian areas, parks, forest edges. Uh, the males are very aggressive and they d defend their territory that way and you often see them chasing each other during the breeding season <clears throat> and they actually build a very loose nest of, of just twigs and a lot of times if you see a, a rose-breasted grosbeak nest you can look up and you can actually see the eggs through the bottom of the nest so red-eyed vireo so these are another common bird um, they're small with a thin beak olive green upper parts and a pale belly they have that, that distinct red eye i don't know if you can see it in the picture and females are very similar so these have a series of slurred notes and they end with a downward note so it sounds like they're asking a question so it sounds like it's saying here i am where are you here i am where are you <laughs> So yeah, I think it sounds exactly like that. Here I am, where are you? Once again, forest bird, a uh, very common bird along the trail. Um, 
our ecologists, we've actually often when we do breeding bird surveys, a lot of times we'll record 10 to 20 of these birds in, in a on a property. And it's just crazy because um you have 10 or 20 of these red-eyed vireos singing all at the same time. It's uh sometimes it's a little overwhelming. <laughs> um but once again, it's awesome to hear because you know that bird is doing well. Common yellow throat, so these are wetland birds. Um, these are actually warblers, so they have that black mask and the yellow throat and breast with the olive yellowish wings and back. Um, the females are brownish above with a yellow throat and breast. So they have a loud series of, of notes, and it sounds like they're saying, like, witchity, 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 witch. So yeah, there you have their song. Uh, once again, they're a wetland bird, so um, they love wetlands. So these are actually a favorite target of the brown-headed cowbird. So this that's a bird kind of parasite. They call it nest parasitism. So where the cowbird will lay its egg in another bird's nest and then take off and then expect that bird to raise the chick. Then a lot of times the, what the brown-headed cowbird chick will hatch first and it'll actually push the other eggs out. So the other species basically has to raise the, the cowbird chick. So an interesting thing with the yellow throats is that a lot, with a lot of warblers, what they do is if a cowbird lays its egg, they'll recognize it and they'll build another nest on top of the original nest, hoping that the cowbird doesn't come back. And sometimes there's, they just keep building the nest on top of the nest. So it's kind of an interesting dynamic. Red-winged blackbird, another wetland bird, um, very, very easy to identify. Um, you got the males with that black body and that red wing with a little yellow tinge. Females are very, very mottled um, with, with browns and yellows. They have that loud musical, okay, Lee. And there you have it. I mean, that's very common, very common sound in, in the wetlands of Ontario. Um, interesting thing about them is the males have many female partners. They can have up to 15 different nests with different females. However, not all those nests are their broods because some of the other males will come in while the territorial male is distracted and they'll actually mate with the females and then get out of there. So it's kind of, once again, an interesting dynamic amongst birds. Indigo bunting. So these are bright blue birds. Um, very easy to identify once again, if you see them. Females are brownish with a white throat. So they have a series of sharp, clear, high pitched notes and they're often often in couplets. So like what, what, where, where? See it, see it. So yeah, if you heard that, it's kind of like in, in couplets, right? So it's two notes, two notes, two notes. So a very common bird forest edges. Oh, so funny. Very common bird in forest edges, abandoned fields, fence rows. So like all other bluebirds, indigo buntings actually lack blue pigment. So what the color that comes from instead is from microscopic structures within the feathers that refract and reflect blue light. So then that's why we see um, that blue color. So now we're going to go to a couple of grassland birds. So we got the bobolink. So this is a medium sized bird with a thick beak and a black, it's black below black and white above and a yellow patch on the back of the head. Once again, very easy bird to identify. Females, not so easy to identify. They have striped brown and yellow appearance, often look like sparrows. So their song, this is one of the coolest songs, I think, um, in Ontario birds. So it's a metallic, bubbly, rambling song. And many compare it to the sound of R2-D2 from the Star Wars movies. So I think it's a bang on. So yeah, I love hearing that that's that song when you're doing breeding bird surveys or hiking through a meadow and you hear that that song. It's just it's awesome to hear. Um, and the reason it's awesome to hear is because bobolinks are threatened in Canada and Ontario due to loss of um, habitat because of the conversion of pasture and hay fields to to crop land, so row crops or subdivisions. So um, you know a lot of their they like large patches of habitat so of, of grassland they're area sensitive 
which means they, they love that large, large patch of grassland. And um, we're just, we're kind of losing that. So what bobolinks have done, interestingly, is they have started to nest in hay fields. So they love hay fields. <coughs> so, um, you know, some of our properties that Bruce Trail has, we have hay fields, we have, we have active agriculture that re, um, remains, but we delay the haying to July 15th because that allows the, the birds to mate have their chicks and allows the chicks time to fledge before the haze take off. So that's one way to kind of help this bird is to keep, you know, fields in active, active hay. So another grassland bird is the Eastern Meadowlark. So there's a medium bird with a short tail and a long beak. And it has a kind of speckled back, white and brown on the upper parts, bright yellow on the under parts with a black V on the chest. And the females are very similar to the males. So these have a series of flute-like whistles that gradually drop in pitch. So people say it kind of sounds like, oh, oh, sweet rosemary. I'm not gonna sing that one. So yeah, there's the Eastern Meadow Lark. Once again, I love hearing that, that song when I'm, I'm walking through a meadow. Because um, once again, like bobolinks, Eastern Meadow Larks are a species at risk. So they're, um, they're considered threatened in Ontario and, and Canada, um, along with the bobolink, because they enjoy similar habitat, right? Those big open grasslands. Um, they are also an area sensitive species. Um, so the meadow larks, a lot of times you'll hear them, you can't see them because they're in the tall grasses, but when they do sing, they like to fly up on a perch um, and just belt out their, their song. So there's also some couple non-native species that are very common that we'll see um, along the trail that are the escarpment. So we got the house finch, European starling, and sorry, that first one is a house sparrow, as that's uh, a little misspelling there. <laughs> And then the house finch on your on your uh, right. So the house sparrow came from Eurasia, European starling, obviously from the European area. And then the house house sparrow came from Eurasia. The house finch came from Western North America. So these these birds sometimes a lot of times are introduced, right? Um, when the settlers came over, they um, either the little birds kind of hid hid in the ships or whatever. Um, or they are brought over on purpose just because people like them. So species of conservation concern. So myself, Adam and Mara, so we're the three ecologists for the Bruce Trail Conservancy. So we have recorded 21 species of birds that are considered rare in Canada and or, and or Ontario using the BTC properties for breeding, migration or overwintering. So I just kind of put up a collage of certain species that we've we've recorded on Bruce Trail properties. So once again, it really it's a huge part of our mission that we protect habitat and restore habitat for these birds, especially the rare ones, you know, that they have a place to live and survive, raise their young, um, you know, just enjoy life. So it's, you know, it's a proud point. Um, that I take very seriously, that the work we do is, is helping these birds, you know, regardless on whether they're rare or not. I mean, it's just fabulous to, to be able to, you know, do this kind of work and protect these, these species. So I tried to rush it in the end. I think I did pretty good. So now we're on to questions. So Brian, thanks so much for that incredible presentation. Um, I, I know I learned a lot and I know everybody did. Uh, we do have a couple of questions, and one of them is a, a comment first, but it's from one of our talented uh, volunteers, Linda Finley, and Linda says, uh, Brian, you have amazing photos. I've noticed them in the guidebook as well, and thanks for your field observation. So uh, thanks for that comment, Linda, and congratulations, Brian. And if you do have the edition of the uh, 30th edition of the Roof Trail Guidebook, you'll see a lot of incredible photography from Brian in there, which is incredible. And then also in that field guide, or also in the... Um, 
in the reference guide, there is a, uh, a little starter uh, identification on birds if you're interested. So um, just check that out and, uh, and um, thank you. So uh, Brian, the other question that we have for you is why are there some birds that show up in our region only in the winter season? Do they come from a colder area looking for a warmer climate or for, from a hot area looking for a cool climate? Yeah, so good question. So most of the birds, I guess, are pretty much most birds migrate. There are the, the odd ones, like even blue jays, they, they're not considered migratory birds, but sometimes blue jays in our region will actually migrate to say the Northern states. And it's just, it's just a matter of movement, uh, food availability, um, whether the winter's getting a little bit harsh, um, so a lot of the birds, like the snow bunting, the horn larks, snowy owls, you know, they breed up in the tundra, which is really harsh conditions <laughs> in the winter. So yeah, they're migrating north to south. Um, I don't know of any bird that migrates like, south to north um, in the winter, um, because most birds are getting out of the winter and out of the harsh conditions. So it's um, north to south is the migration pattern. Okay, thank you, Brian. And then a great question from super talented BTC staff member, uh, Lindsay Wilkerson. What's a bird that's on your bucket list to see? That's a good one. Actually, I, I actually got one this fall, um, the uh, evening grosbeak. I've never seen one. I've seen lots of pictures, but um, um, I don't know if people know, I recently moved up to the peninsula and so I actually had a flock of evening grosbeaks come to my bird feeder, and it was pretty exciting. Um, I had the camera out, took a lot of pictures. But the one bird I haven't really seen really good up close is a snowy owl. I've seen them from a distance, but I've never seen one um, really up close. But that's that one's on my bucket list. Okay, great. And then I think just in the interest of time, we've got uh, one more. A question. Uh, and so this is from Mark Glendon, again, another incredible uh, talented volunteer, but how does climate change affect uh, BDC bird habitat restoration? Yeah, so what um, what we're looking at now when we're doing restoration work, because we're thinking climate change is going to affect species movement. We don't know what the timeline is on that, but what you're going to see is more kind of southern species will move kind of north. So we, we might start to get maybe some bird species that are more common in the United States. We'll start to see them up in um, Southern Ontario. And likewise, birds that are common in Southern Ontario will probably eventually be more common um, up in the boreal forest region. But when, when we're looking at restoration, we do consider kind of like the species the southern plant species, should we start planting some of those when we're looking at restoration in our northern sections? For instance, um, like tulip trees, shagbark hickories, um, sassafras, those are kind of Carolinian species. So we're actually looking at maybe we should start planting some of those in more of our northern sections. So as the climate changes over time, we're, we're already going to have trees that are assimilated to a warmer climate. So that's kind of what we're looking at when it comes to, to restoration. Okay, great. Thank you, Brian. So we do have a couple more questions and we'll make sure that we get back to those individuals just in the interest of time. But Brian, um, I know you're probably always available to answer any questions if members have any and they can reach out to you for bird identification or any other uh, ecological knowledge. So um, thank you for that. And um, just uh, thanks, Brian, for your, uh, for your passion, for your expertise, for your love for birds. And um, we're really grateful for all the work that you do for the BTC. Thank you. Well, thank you, Michael. I just, anybody has any comments on my, my the way I said the bird song and then how it sounded? <laughs> just to see how, how good I was at uh, copying the sound. <laughs> all right, that's great. All right, well, thanks again, everybody, for joining us, and uh, Happy New Year to you all, and we'll see you again soon. Cheers. Thank you so much.